Okay, hey dames, Hello and good morning everyone. My name is Tim Fox and I'm originally from the Kainai Nation, which is a part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. My family comes from the Igapo Gakes clan and in English it translates to the Many Children's clan and I'm very proud of where I come from, but it hasn't always been that way. So today I'm hoping to shed some light on many important issues by using my personal story as parallels to the need to repair a relationship across the country and moving into generations to come. So last year I attended a presentation where an elder, mentor and uh, uh, academic from my community, Leroy Little Bear, was giving a talk on Canada 150 from an Indigenous perspective. So being Indigenous myself, I was intrigued to come and listen to Leroy present because I knew that Canada 150 was a point of contention for many people, many Indigenous people across Turtle Island. And Leroy said many things at this presentation, many profound things as he often, as he often does when he presents. And one of those things has always stuck out with me. He said, Every society in one way or another lays claim to a territory. Within the claimed territory, a culture arises from the mutual relationship with the land. A culture consists of paradigmic concepts, values, and customs. Paradigms are the tacit infrastructures members of a society utilize for their beliefs, behavior, and relationships. So in other words, the way societies and nations are supposed to be built are meant to come from the values, beliefs, and customs of the original people of that land. But when you think of things like the Canadian National Anthem, symbols of the Canadian flag, and all things that are considered to be Canadian, they're not based on the original customs, beliefs, and values of the original people of this land. So Leroy was an ambassador for Canada 150. But he made it clear to the people who asked him to be an ambassador that he was going to use that platform to tell the missing story of Canada 150 and be a voice for the Indigenous people uh, of this territory. So within this vein, we have begun to develop a community resource that talks about the importance of providing and giving voice and context as well as acknowledgement. What is land acknowledgement? Those of us that are continuing our oral history are blessed. What we shared, that was told from way back. We were part of the ecosystem. We were not masters of it. You know, after we grow up from our biological mothers, the earth becomes our caregiver. Everything that we need is there. Well, we were raised to believe that everything has a spirit, and that everything around us is alive and has a purpose. The spirit of the land and our spirit. You can't separate land and people. In Treaty 7 territory, I'm accepted, I'm something, and I'm with my people. We acknowledge Treaty 7 territory. We acknowledge the Treaty 7 nations, the Pikani, Siksiga, Gaina, Stony Nakoda, and the Sutina First Nations. We acknowledge the ancestral territory of Siksiga Tsitipi, the Blackfoot Confederacy, and the home of Métis Region Number 3. This is one of the reasons why it's so crucial to understand why we acknowledge traditional territories. We need to foster a world of equality and balance. My hope is that all across the country moving forward will acknowledge territories and prioritize the acknowledgement of traditional territories the same way we acknowledge and prioritize singing of a national anthem. It's about creating that balance. So this year's TEDx theme is focused on Legom, as you know. It's a Swedish term that centers around the balance of life. And I can resonate with this theme both personally and professionally. So from a personal perspective, it's about continuing to create balance in my life by fostering a relationship that I have with the land. This is important because pre-European contact, Indigenous people have always had a strong relationship with the land and spirituality. Our belief is that everything has a spirit. 
animate things, inanimate things carry spirits meant to create balance for individuals and for the environment, but it's, it's meant to benefit everyone. That was our belief system. I've been taught stories of living off the land in a way that left enough for future generations. Gratitude for the many gifts this earth provides us with was and still is incorporated into ceremony and offering of tobacco. Hunters would only hunt enough so that our families and communities were fed. We understood that no one above this, above the creator governed this land in our relationship with it. Traditional community structures fostered consensus. And although there, there still are and there were people who held leadership roles, everyone was involved in the decision-making process. Everyone had that equal voice in our communities. Children were at the center of our community structures. They were the most important people of our communities. In some nations, Infants were kept in moss bags for the first few months of their life. They weren't allowed to touch the earth just because they were seen to be so sacred. They were going to carry our way of life, our values, our traditions, our spirituality into the future for future generations. Language, identity. Our traditional family structure goes beyond the biological connection that we have to our parents, and it extends to our aunts, our uncles, our grandparents, who we also consider our parents. Cousins become siblings. Biologically, I have a younger brother, and I have one sister, biologically. But in a traditional sense, I have many brothers, and I have many sisters. There is diversity within our nations, and depending on where you come from, there are different variations and teachings of the medicine wheel. The consistency with this teaching of the medicine wheel is about creating balance. From an individual perspective, our belief is that everyone has a medicine wheel that makes up our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual selves. The challenge we have is keeping that medicine wheel into, in balance. So as an example, if you're stressed out about something, maybe work, school, personal relationships, chances are the mental quadrant of your medicine wheel is taking over. So how can you find ways to focus on other areas of your medicine wheel to bring yourself back into balance? Go for a run, a walk, work out, talk to someone, pray or light smudge. It's about trying to find that balance and, and, and disruption so I'm emphasizing all of this. I'm emphasizing traditional indigenous paradigms of thought and practice when it comes to relationships with the land and spirituality and family. Um, I'm emphasizing where I come from for a reason. There was a disruption in our way of life and how we value family and how we practice ceremony. Looking back at my own school experience, I attended a school with mostly non-indigenous peers and while my Classmates were engaged in a lesson and asking questions. I was the child that sat at the back of the classroom and I kept to myself. It wasn't because I didn't understand the lesson that was being taught to me or that I was incapable of making friends. It was just that my mind was on other struggles going, and challenges going on in my life, most likely due to toxic stress or loss. Now, my story isn't that different from other narratives of systemic discrimination, addictions and poverty. I experienced all of that growing up, but I normalized it. I thought that only Indigenous people experienced that because I couldn't see that happening with my other classmates. So I carried a lot of shame with me. I wasn't always as proud of where I come from as I am today. I, I even remember being in school and hearing some teachers uh, refer to me in very discriminatory and stereotypical ways. That was my experience going to school. I resented my parents. I didn't agree with the way they parented me or some of the decisions that they made and negative experiences that they exposed me to. And so I grew up with that kind of struggle. My shame was amplified the older I got and as I experienced varying sectors of society and personally. But I continue today to carry a healing journey and focus on my connection to culture and spirituality through the land and my relationship. 
Thankfully, my healing continues and will continue until I leave this world. I'm also very proud to be indigenous. I'm very proud of where I come from. I have an incredibly close relationship to my parents and I no longer hold any resentment towards them. Today, I'm the director of Indigenous Relations with the Calgary Foundation. We inspire philanthropy so we can support the charitable sector to do the amazing work that they have a mission to do. In my role, I'm focused on the area of systems change and finding ways to mobilize the Truth and Reconciliation Commission at the foundation and in the broader community. Part of this work includes developing ways we can collectively work towards strengthening a relationship in need of repair. I'm talking about the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. From a professional sense, it is about bringing the, the disruption that I referred to to the forefront of the conversation when we're talking about shared history and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's important that when you think of history and the residential school experience for Indigenous people, it's not just my history, it's your history as well. It's a shared history. A lot of things seem to be surfacing when it comes to Indigenous initiatives these days but there's still so much work to be done to address the historical disruption that still impacts Indigenous communities today. The imbalance and equality for Indigenous people is prevalent in so many ways and ranges from little to no access to clean drinking water for most First Nations communities across the country, to an abundance of Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited going missing or being murdered, to Indigenous young people losing their lives at the hands of non-Indigenous people and no one being held accountable. To the continued loss of land and resources from our communities and removal of our children from communities. It's relentless and it still happens today. Imbalance? No, I think it's injustice. There's very little separating my personal experience and my professional experience, as you could probably tell from these examples. I do believe change will happen and shifts will occur, but I, I would be naive to think I will see the significant changes we need in my lifetime. I think, uh, I'm hopeful that they will, but it's not the reason I continue to do this work. I am motivated to do this work for future generations, like my daughter, who is seven years old. She will become an Indigenous woman one day, and that's both exciting and terrifying. Sorry. There's a reality to our situation where I'm scared that anything can happen to her. She can go missing, or she can be murdered, and nothing will be done. And based on recent incidences for Colton Bushi and Tina Fontaine, she can lose her life at the hands of a non-Indigenous person and no one will be held accountable. That's what I think about when I think about my daughter growing up. On the flip side, I'm excited about the idea of my daughter overcoming layer upon layer of challenge and unequal prioritization and experiencing a level of success that we see in so many Indigenous women today like her mother, her grandmother, and her aunt. And in the broader community, where there's an abundance of Indigenous women succeeding in leadership, advocacy, and success, all of these women inspire so many, including my daughter and I. Another point of Leroy's presentation last year focused on the age of reason. From what I understand, as, and as he explained it, the age of reason is about mathematics and science. If you couldn't prove it through math or science, it was discounted and was seen as irrational. Now the age of reason was in full bloom at the time of colonization of North American indigenous people. So you can imagine what European settlers were thinking when they came across our people practicing traditional forms of spirituality and culture and connection to land. They had no problem committing atrocities on our people and it still continues today. There is a thought pattern that exists. Cindy Blackstock refers to it as a colonial dichotomy of the savage and the civilized. 
the savage being indigenous people and the civilized being the settler community. One of the pioneers of this thought pattern is the well-known Sir John A. Macdonald. Now we all learn about John A. Macdonald as Canada's first prime minister. And only recently have we begun to learn about the, his, his intentional destruction and assimilation efforts of the indigenous people. He said, Indian children should be taken away from their parents so as to eliminate their barbarian influence and expose the children to the benefits of civilization. The teacher has been sent out as an educational missionary to introduce culture changes in Indian societies. It's a thought pattern that fueled colonization and still exists today. Adopting indigenous paradigms of practice and culture is not only needed to create balance in life for indigenous people, but it is imperative for the sustainability of this land. We need to seek to understand movements of change. Gone are the days when indigenous people had no say in all matters associated with our lives. We need to be acknowledged and respected as equal members of this society who have an insurmountable, insurmountable opportunity to contribute to the social and economic fabric of this country. After all, <clears throat> the Indigenous population is the fastest growing segment of the Canadian population. So Canada needs to prepare itself for this growth by fostering a society and a nation of balance and equality. Lagom for me is related to mobilizing efforts of reconciliation. At the Calgary Foundation, we have entered our own journey of reconciliation. And while this is an ongoing process, we have already begun to experience a shift in how we work. And this shift is evident in very small, subtle ways, but also very profound, intentional realizations that are embedded into our practice at work and at home. But we are only one small piece of a larger puzzle of society. Together, all of us, indigenous and non-indigenous communities alike, can create the substantial changes we need on a broad scale so that we, we live in a society and a world of legom, of respect, equality, reciprocity.